enjoy sharing good news. I think it's part of our tradition that we always want to hear the hero one in the end. Well, let me reassure you, in the end, because of him, we win. But in the meantime, we lose because we really haven't done the things he said. We haven't lived up to the measure of the fullness of the grace we've been given because we've taken grace and used it for our own selfish desires. We really have become that wealthy Christian that everybody likes to hate and says, oh, well, you know, it's the other guy because we can find some church that's very prosperity doctrine. So we think we're not the ones guilty of being wealthy or rich. But you see, we've been given rich inheritance. We, in this land, should be leading the way for unity, for brotherhood, for love, for compassion, for reaching out in the ministry. And we are. In reality, we're fighting each other at times. We're jumping to wrong conclusions. We're divisive. We, we have political turmoils. We have all these issues that seem to be contrary to what the Christian life is about. And I'm fascinated by that because I would rather be here talking about Jesus and wanting to share Him when I find people are bored and they want to talk about sin and indulging in it and doing it and being a part of it. I had to take time away from sharing you know, some of the the neat stuff that God is doing, you know, in my life and and reality of how he's growing these plants, you know, for tomatoes and and how they've bloomed and how the rains have come and fallen on them and caused them to grow even more and now the sun is shining on them and I'm expecting them to just kind of explode. But instead of talking about that, I had to talk about how Christians got carried away just recently on another example of seeing something and assuming and making false assumptions about a person and it turned out to be not that person at all. The person was not who they said they were in the picture. And that's sad that Christians who should know better are being deceived regularly, especially on the internet. When it's such a powerful tool, it's being used for so much deception that unfortunately believers who could be profiting from it by growing in grace and mercy and touching people's lives that they never would have seen anywhere else are spreading unfortunately a lot of lies, a lot of false rumors, a lot of stuff that God said don't do. So while it's true that the power of the tongue has the ability to kill, Unfortunately, the power of the internet has the ability to slaughter, and it's doing it very effectively, and it's being done by Christians. It ought not to be named, named among us. As a matter of fact, it ought not to be so even with us. But even as I had to address it in an article and write about it, you know, it just it made me sad. You know, it reminded me of two things. One. As much as I try to, you know, design this house, you know, apartment that I live in, to enjoy it, you know, this summer and to enjoy it now, I'm constantly reminded in the ministry that this world is not my home. And sometimes these people aren't my people. Because my people, we want to bring as many as we can to Jesus. We want the world to be saved, really. But we want the entire world to know that they can come to Jesus and find a better way. They don't have to get involved in politics. They don't have to go to war. They don't have to learn things that are going to do nothing for them in the kingdom of God. But they can rather turn their eyes upon Jesus and find mercy and grace. They can find strength and forgiveness. They can find that ability to live in this life effectively affecting people in the entire world, much less the universe. And I just don't get how people will turn that down in order to have their pound of flesh or their day of sin. Except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, 
it brings forth much fruit. He that loves his life shall lose it, and he that hates his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. John 12, 24 and 25. You know, I like that. He that hates his life in this world. I don't see that as much as people claim to do that. Because they don't say they hate it. I don't see a man in his man cave saying he hates his Harley or he hates his man cave or he hates this, you know, brand new car he bought or the new construction on the house, you know, or some job that they just got or the football season. Oh, I hear them hating the president, but I don't hear them hating the things that God said to hate. You see, I think that a lot of people have gotten to where they love the world and they love living in the world. And they aren't occupying, they are rather possessing the world, and the world is possessing them. You know, I I see this whole devotional and it talks about denying a self and how really In each step along the way of it, it talks about giving up the things of the world. And the more that I look around and talk to people, the less that I see anybody giving up the world. You know, this world is not your home. If you're caught and entangled in the world, you will be raptured. That's just the bottom line. You will not go in the rapture if you are stuck in the world. If you are literally entangled in it to such a degree that sin is holding you back. Because God will separate you from those that he's called. Not all that claim the name or have walked with God at some point in time, or even know that Jesus is coming, or even know that the rapture is true, are going in the rapture. Just because you know it, doesn't mean you're going with it. That's the point that Jesus made, especially in the parable of ten virgins. People like to say, now, where they didn't used to say it anymore. They say, well, that's not about the Lord's return. Excuse me? Try explaining it. Try telling me that looking for the Master's return and the bridegroom and the bride is about the tribulation period. Try again. Unfortunately, there are a lot of people that don't realize that when you hear someone teaching that, it's giving you an excuse for a way out rather than a conviction to get ready for the soon return of Jesus Christ. Living in the latter days, being that we're in the last generation, and there is no doubt about that part, your direction in life should be to begin to get your house in order. It should have already been going on anyways, but getting your house in order doesn't mean you get it all cleaned up so that you could come and live for the next thousand years. No, it means you start exiting from all these things that are holding you back in the world. You start making your exit plan and strategy to be gone soon. Not because you expect it to happen in 20 years, but because you expect it to happen next year or the next. I say it won't happen in 2012, but the point is, get ready now. Be ready tomorrow. Be ready always, because you don't know what day or the hour that you might die. But even that, I think, my God, you would think that people knowing that would get out of their world, you know, and get out of these things that are, you know, possessing their time and would rather be more interested in telling more people about it. I mean, Harold Camping had a very positive thing going. He convinced a lot of people that a certain day Jesus was going to return, and they went out and lived it like it would happen. I wonder if we're living like we know we're in the last generation. I question whether or not you know if you're living in the last generation. Because you see, I do. I have planned out my life accordingly that everything from 2012 onward was to be a huge outreach, a constant day after day, sweating and fighting and posting and writing and doing anything that I can, everywhere I can, to warn people, to tell people, to share with people, to 
make known and relate Jesus in a way that they would understand no matter what it takes so that from 2013 onward there would be just always everything in my life being given over to that purpose that one dedicated reason for my existence to declare that Jesus is coming and we've been preparing that in Biblical Christian Network for 20 years now we've been going on and on and on you know slowly accumulating all the material so we could just repost it repost it repost it to go out and not to sit back and say oh well there's a website go check it out no to go out and seek and save the lost not to sit back and let them come find us and to do it freely without having to look for money somewhere but to take the money we have and invest it in the kingdom of God to take everything that we have all of our tools or ministries whatever it is we have chairs even 24 hours of time you know to try to invest that constantly back into the kingdom of heaven because I know and I do know this much as I don't want it to be true and much as I would rather that everyone would be saved the reason why I don't read the rest of the devotionals is because I know that a lot of you are even watching the video of this but you'll probably the ones that do, they already know that they're getting ready for the Lord's return and they want to do everything they can. They have a relationship with Jesus. But some of you, I just have to say it once, you don't talk to God. And you don't ask God about the end times because you don't want to know because you figure if you ignore it, it'll go away. And that if they're wrong, you don't have to worry about it. But if they're right, you're already worried about it because you don't want to know because you're indulging in the world. And the other part that makes me really sad is that I know with all of my 35 plus years of being a Christian, there will be people that I never would have suspected and I never would have thought that will probably be taken in the rapture. That I'll be amazed you know, that they would be saved. But the ones that probably most people expect to be, probably won't be. Because God sees the heart. And I know that for myself, I always tell people, look, you got to pray to be counted worthy. It's not a question of fixing yourself up or getting ready. It's a question of praying and asking God to make you worthy to be counted among those that are going to be spared that tribulation that's coming upon the world. Because if you're not denying yourself now, you're not going later. But if you're denying yourself now, you'll go with him later. Otherwise, I'm sorry. I'll be the first one to tell you, not everyone's going in the rapture. And that's just the way it is, because Jesus said it. Jesus wrote it. Jesus declared it. Two shall be taken in the field. One shall be taken, the other left. Two shall be walking on the highway. One shall be taken, the other left. Two will hear this message that I'm sharing. One will deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow him. The other will go right back into the sin they're indulging in. That makes me sad. Because I know that in my life, with the sin that I deal with in my own world as I exist, and the sin that happens at times for me daily that God delivers me from my sins because I confess my sins to Him. I ask Him, Lord, please forgive me and cleanse me from all unrighteousness and make me a vessel holy unto You committed to share You in a way that though I may not be the perfect vessel, though I may not be the great man of God or the great evangelist, in some simple way, Lord Jesus, by the mercy and grace you've given me, would you help me to share that with someone else that needs it today? That they're trying, and that's all you really wanted from us, was that we would be willing to at least try. What are you doing about the kingdom of God today? Ask yourself that. 
ask yourself very, very seriously. Because what you're doing today will determine what you do tomorrow. And except you turn it around and start doing what he says, you will be left behind. <laughs>